going on in the Christian community. A lot of wrong doctrine and indoctrination. People coming up with questions to discredit the authenticity and the message of Christ. If today you were to ask a pastor a question, what will that question be? Is it recorded somewhere that it is on the exact 25th of December that we celebrate the birth of Jesus? Why do we die? Now the Bible says that uh, when you receive Jesus Christ, you receive life, eternal life. Then why should we die before we live eternally? Uh, my curiosity will be, what happens when someone dies? When is Jesus coming? 2,000 years ago, it is said, and every sign that has been uh, talked about has already come to pass. But Jesus has not yet come. The Bible records we should forgive 70 times, 7 times. Does it mean we should make mistakes as often as we can? If Jesus loves us so much, as he says, <coughs> why does he allow, why does God allow uh, calamities to befall us? Uh, 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 storms to come to us. People are fighting, people are dying. There is pain, sadness, sorrow all over. Why doesn't he just take it away? Because he can do it. Now, right here at KA Television, we are introducing an avenue, a platform, where we are merging pastors from the northern and western hemisphere together with those from eastern hemisphere, coming together to answer very critical questions that you may have as a believer, as a non-believer, to get to understand about God, the Trinity, Christ, and everything pertaining salvation. It is every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. on the East African time and 9.30 a.m. on New Mexican time where the conversation is happening. See you there. Wow, I love the introduction, guys. It's looking good. We're live in New Mexico. I have Pastor Jim Montoya and Grover Dobbins of ChristianBody.net with us. We are uh, here early in the morning, 9.30 in the morning, as you just said. I love that introduction, guys. Welcome to all of our yeah. friends. Good evening in Africa and those watching across the world uh, as we gather together as one, the Eastern and the Western Hemisphere. Love those questions. Still, we'll get to them. But today we're going to talk about altars. We picked it up last week. There's a little bit of, of difference, of course, between America and Africa. But we want to clarify those things today. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. Uh, let me uh, let me go to Pastor Jim Montoya. We'll open up in prayer and then we'll get on with our conversation about altars today. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege brothers in Kenya, Lord God, your love, your love for all nation, your heart that all would come to repentance, your heart, you want all of us saved, your heart to us is not wanting, trying to appease you, Lord God, for, for your love is so great towards all that you want us all saved, all, all, all of us brought to a point of repentance. So we thank you this day, this day that you have made. We're going to be glad and rejoice in this day as we learn more from your word, Lord God. We learn every day, Lord God. We don't understand things, but come, Holy Spirit, bring understanding, bring your wisdom, bring your knowledge to us and the faith to believe in and to speak, Lord God, as you reveal to us 
In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, let's introduce our buddies over there in Nigeria. We, we welcome you this evening for all those watching. Let's see, we have Pastor Simon, we have Elijah, and a new guest today, Pastor Wellington, uh, Mashila from the, uh, let me get this right here, uh, Jesus, the Truth Ministry Outreach. Uh, welcome to the program, gentlemen. I'm not hearing you on the Africa side. Well, let's get started here in New Mexico then. Again, we talked about altars last week, and I did want to uh, kind of emphasize some of the scriptural backing of that. And so I looked up a little research, and this is where we want to come from when it's asked the pastor. We don't want it to just be my opinion or anybody else's opinion. We want to go right to the word of God. And so I'm looking at Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. And this is the very first biblical altar. Now let's clarify, because we want to stick with the biblical altar aspect and take you away from some of the other issues that people are dealing with, not only in Africa, but in Pakistan, India. We have here what they call the Day of the Dead, uh, celebrating the dead, and they build altars and they bring food. We're going to talk about biblical altars, and we're going to try to tear down and uproot, uh, kind of like uh, we see some of the people doing in the Bible in the Old Testament. But in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, it says, And Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean four-footed animal and of every clean fowl or bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. This is the very first altar recorded in the scriptures. Now, the thing we want to get out of that is that this was prior to the law, prior to the tabernacle in the desert, the tent in the desert, prior to the temple that was built by uh, Solomon and, and the second temple of Herod that Jesus had walked in and among as it was prophesied. But there were altars, biblical altars, and we want to understand what that is. So let me, let me go to... Uh, uh, Grover, uh, Grover, th this is one of the, the things I got online. It says the topic is ill understood in this side of the continent and generational altars have affected a lot uh, the journey of not only many Christians, but non-Christians at large. And so we want to clarify, yes, there are altars. There are altars to Buddha. There are altars to Muhammad. There are altars to uh, the million over a million Indian gods. Uh, but Grover, maybe you can clarify from an American standpoint, what, what would you say of an altar today? Well, Mark, the, uh, thank you for the question. This is, a, this is an exciting question. Uh, encounter here when we're looking forward to this uh i think that you know obviously altars are places of worship if you see that in in the genesis 8 with noah and and many times in the old testament altars are the place of worship now they can be worshiped to god they are also worshiped to baal and other other false gods obviously throughout scripture so we're looking at that and i think that uh to to keep it brief here in america uh, we don't see, I don't think we see the, the spiritual aspect of altars as much as we see the, the cultural, the, the, uh, the uh, you know, there's finances, there's governments, there's, there's power, there's uh, um, this thing here. These are, these are some of the altars that I think we experience in America, but they are kind of a diversion. They aren't really the, the reality. The, the altar that we worship at in the reality is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he is our, our place of worship today. He's the, the point of contact with God. And, uh, but we have to realize that in the, in the culture, there are many other things, many things that stand against. They are satanic altars. Uh, there are family altars that, uh, that go through generations. Uh, maybe some of them are, are, have some good things about them. Many of them don't. But the, the, the main thing that we want to just keep people focused on, it's about God. This is there's the altar of God is the place that we, we come to. Uh, and the altar in the New Testament version is our hearts. It's our lives that we present to him, uh, however and wherever. It can be a place, 
that we designate or a place of that we can we feel like we can con converse with God, we can have a, a relationship with Him, but it, it doesn't have to be that. So I, I I hope that helps a little bit. I don't want to get off on on the details of this until we get further into the discussion here. Okay, so let's let's see. Do we have uh, audio with our brothers in Africa? We're not hearing from the Eastern Hemisphere here. <laughs> All right, guys, if you could work on the sound on your end, uh, we're coming across fine here. So let me go to Jim. Jim, let, let me read this because I just heard this this morning, and, and I think this is important, and I think this will clarify. Again, we want to approach it from the biblical perspective here, and, and it's a few verses I'm going to read out of Numbers chapter 7. Now, this is at the tabernacle. This is the tent of meeting. Remember, God gives Moses the blueprint. The blueprint is set up to be exactly what's going on in heaven so that God's kingdom can come and his will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I'm going to read out of Numbers chapter 7, uh, beginning in verse 84. Now, this is after all of the 12 tribes come and they bring uh, offerings for the altar. So listen to what this says. This was the dedication offering for the altar of burnt offering from the leaders of Israel on the day when it was anointed, 12 platters of silver, 12 silver basins, 12 golden bowls. This was nothing but the best. Remember, this was for the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God. Verse 85 and number seven says, each platter of silver, weighing 130 shekels, each basin 70, all the silver vessels weigh 2,400 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, the 12 golden bowls full of incense. So here we have the essence. You and I are the essence of Christ. Day. Remember, we are the temple of the living God, but this is incense for the altar, weighing 10 shekels apiece after the shekel of the sanctuary, all the gold of the bowls, being 120 shekels, all the oxen for the burnt offerings were 12. Amount of uh, sacrifices that had to be made. All right, we're looking at uh, the, the oxen for the burnt offering were 12 bulls, the rams 12, the male lambs a year old 12, together with their cereal offering and the male goats for a sin offering 12 and all the oxen for the sacrifice of the peace offerings were 24 bulls, the rams 60, the mules, uh, the, the male goats 60, the male lambs a year old 60. This was the dedication of the altar of the burnt offering after it was anointed. And notice we end chapter seven of numbers with verse 89. This is the important part about the biblical altar of God. And when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, remember Grover just mentioned that, it's a place of meeting with God. It's a place of offering up ourselves as a living sacrifice. He heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat. Remember, his mercies are new every morning in Christ Jesus that was upon the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim and he spoke to Moses. Hebrews chapter one says, God still speaks to us today. Now this Ark of the Covenant that we're talking about is a reference of the type and shadow going back to what we just read about the first altar being built by Noah after the flood, which was God's righteous judgment on the earth to bring righteousness back. Remember, Noah was preaching righteousness. So Jim, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it to you with, with a little bit of that background. We have other scriptures to share with you, and then hopefully we'll get the audio up and running in Kenya and hear from our brothers over there. But, Jim, what do you have for today? Well, the sacrifices, I mean, they, there was no sparing of cost. They gave the ultimate, the ultimate here for the sacrifice to enter into the place of, as you mentioned, the covenant, the, the promises of God. God's relationship to us was reached through sacrifices, through the presentation of sacrifice. And this relationship began and ends with the, I mean, the last verse there, they heard from God. Well, to hear from God, that was 
That's what we want to do in relationship is we want to connect. And that comes through, at this time, through the sacrifices of, of animals. Of, as I mentioned here, uh, rams and, and oxen and so forth, the offering that had to be made, which was not sparing any cost. And this relationship is, I guess, to part of the confirmation of the covenant itself and the promise with us, whereby now in the New Testament time, we heard him through his son, Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifices, the connection with relationships. All mankind has a desire, and I'm speaking to my brothers and sisters in Kenya, here in the United States, here in the world. We want to have this relationship with him and trying to establish relationships with different means out there through what? And I use the word, the fear of God. Man, un, un, uh, what is it? Unredeemed man seeking to reach God through different man-made efforts that they have because of the fear, the fear factor. This is where I'm coming from. The fear factor that we have to appease God. If I use that word, appeasement of God. So he, in good pleasure, now we have a relationship with him, which is not necessarily anymore because a relationship has been established all over, already with Jesus Christ through his sacrifice. The sacrifices, he, the opposite of ourselves giving, uh, giving to make him to appease him. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice that came out there to redeem all mankind. So he's not, we don't have to appease him. We got to believe in the work that he did, the love that he has, and the love he has for all of mankind. Like it says here in uh, in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 41 about himself out there. He's, he is the ultimate sacrifice. He has already established us out there, and we are to enter in relationship with him. He says, if you're not, if you're not, oh, Jacob, the word that comes out, if you're not, oh, Jacob, and that's kind of the word we're entering with relationship and not by fear, but by relationship. And he says, everybody, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with, with my righteous right hand. It's he, we don't have to appeal. We need to believe the work that he did for us because of his love for us and for love for all mankind. All but right. Well, we do have sound back in, in Kenya. The offering God made to him again. We could not connect with God. Good. Brothers. All right. <laughs> we want so, to hear from so, you. Uh, yeah, we're hearing some noise in the background. I don't know where it's coming <laughs> from, guys, but check your audio. Um because I don't Hello. know if it's Jim or Grover or so. So for our brothers in Kenya, uh, in Nairobi, let's start with Pastor Wellington. Welcome to the program. Welcome to Ask the Pastor International. Thanks for joining us today. I know there's a big Thank difference you. between the Eastern and Western Hemisphere and the understanding of altars specifically. And we're trying to clarify it biblically, but maybe uh, you could uh, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your ministry, and then. Get into the conversation about altars. Uh, my name is Wellington Mshila, uh, commonly known as Willie Mshila, and I come from the lower, uh, the upper uh, part of the coast province, a town called Voi. I'm a teacher of the word. I preach, and I, the first thing that I did in ministry was to lead worship. Uh, <clears throat> To lend a thought about uh, the topic, I think I would like to start from why it is important to have an altar. And uh, an altar, I believe, is a place where, where the spiritual realm gets uh, legal uh, access to be able to, to intervene or touch humanity. I will start uh, probably from Genesis chapter 1, from verse 26, <clears throat> where the Bible says that uh, God, when he created man, he gave him the dominion over the air, over everything that creeps on the land, and also under the waters. So man was given the authority, uh, delegated authority from God, and through that, uh, it, it's like... Uh, Humanity has the legal right to operate on earth. And I believe uh, that the realm of the spirit for it to come into the world 
it needs uh, an opening, it needs access. And I believe that's how God created it. And I believe that an altar is uh, a, a point or a place where the realm of the spirit gets uh, a legal right to be able to come into the world and affect it, whether positively, if it is from the realm of God, or negatively, it is if it's from the realm of, of the enemy. So I believe that an altar is a place where uh, it's like a point of contact for the realm of the spirit to get access to be able to affect our lives. Yes, yes. And, and, and uh, 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 Elijah, I'm going to go to you next. Uh, again, we're trying to understand and, and we clarify through some of the scriptures. We'll get into more as we go through this, because this is a very heavy duty process here we want to be the living stones of god right being built up into the temple uh, offering ourselves up as a living sacrifice of praise but i know as as i'm listening listening to pastor wellington talk we have here in in louisiana specifically in america a lot of voodoo uh you know we have uh, uh as i said day of the dead here uh in in new mexico and mexico uh, and so it, so we built altars and we offer up food to our ancestral spirits. Uh, we see that a lot with the Native American tribes that we have here in America. But uh, uh, Elijah, maybe you could explain a little bit more from the African side for those of us that are watching here in the United States and other countries around the world about the altars that you guys are dealing with on the negative side in Africa itself, and then and then how people can apply the biblical aspect of altars in their own personal life today there. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I think today we've started on a good note. Thank you so much, Mark. I think Africa, Asia, Latin America have got some things in common. Yeah, because here in Africa, according to our traditions, according to how we've been brought up, we are very much conversant with altars. Because in Africa, you find your grandmother was a witch, your grandfather was a top sorcerer, and uh, there are things you are proud of, actually. You say, oh, my grandfather is the greatest. So here in Africa, altars can be a gathering of witches, a gathering of sorcerers, a gathering of wizards in a coven, and they stand before a shrine, and that place becomes an altar. An altar can be a shrine that even a grandmother, mother, sister, brother has erected in his or her bedchamber. It can be in a tree, it can be in a river, it can be in a pot that is hidden somewhere. An altar can be anything. To some extent, even children are put as altars, and they use the Swahili word kiti, which means a seat or a throne, that that child becomes the house or the temple of demons of witches or marine spirits and that child is set apart as an altar and that family could be rich it could be influential it could be powerful but that child's life is in misery the child could be either mentally retarded or artistic the child could be drooling saliva and uh, anyone who doesn't know will be wondering oh maybe it's a medical issue but here in Africa, we'll understand that is a, a throne of demons or has been set apart as an altar. Likewise, also, we have Christians in Africa, and uh, many Africans are so much spiritual that anything can be tied to altar. From a Christian perspective, we understand that altars have priests. Any altar cannot exist unless there is a priest. Whether it's demonic, there will be a priest who will be in charge of making incantation. And altars also enforces patterns. There are patterns in families. People may not get married. In families, people may be getting miscarriage. In families, people may be mentally retarded. And whenever we see some patterns, we understand there is an altar and there is a priest that is enforcing such patterns. When we come to the Christian aspect, in our last episode, I say that an altar can be anything, any place where God chooses to reveal himself. And I also say that the power of an altar is subject to the revelation of God that he has given on that particular altar. 
And I also say that we connect to an altar through faith <laughs> and through revelation. But today, as I was waiting on God, I felt uh, to bring another aspect of altars in our Christian life today. You find that the physical world is just as real as the spiritual world. And many times the physical world gives us a glimpse of what happens in the spirit. And that is why God brought Moses before his temple and showed him a pattern that was not from this earth. And he was told to make altars in line with the pattern that he was shown. So in that pattern that Moses was given, we have the brazen altar. The brazen altar, when we come into the New Testament, the moment you pray in your closet, the moment you pray in your bedchamber, you may not be born again seeking salvation, or you are born again, you come before God in repentance, saying, God, kindly forgive my sins, wash me. You walk through that brazen altar, which is the finished work on the cross on Calvary. The blood that Jesus shed, now it stands in the place of that brazen altar that was in the outer courts. After that, you get into the holy place and you stand before the second altar, which is the altar of incense. And here, spiritually speaking, whenever you continue in prayer after repentance, you move into the place of intercession. There are two that help you here. We have Jesus who maketh intercession, and we have the Holy Ghost who intercedes with groanings that cannot be uttered. The moment you intercede and you pray in the Spirit, you are before that altar of incense. When you check in Revelation chapter 8, it will give you an example, an angel with a golden censer, and he has incense, and he has the prayers of the saints. Another place, you have an angel with a bowl full of incense, and you are told, they are also the prayers of the saints. Once you continue, you are now pulled into the holy place, which is the holy of holies, where we used to have the third altar, which is the ark on which is the very mercy seat. And according to the Bible in Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 10, the Bible tells us this is the very presence of God. And we have access to into this third altar, the most holy place, through what Jesus did, the blood is shed and the body. We are now brought in before the altar. I want you to know when we speak about altars in the Christian perspective, we are not shedding any more animal blood because Jesus did it once and for all. But now when we appear in the holy place, we appear to fellowship, to have koinonia with God, to have deep intimacy a relationship with God, where the Spirit takes over your physical body. At times you can even lose sense of time. You can lose sense of what is happening around you. And God begins to speak to you to a deeper level. That's why Paul says, I know a man who was caught into the third heaven, whether in the flesh or not, I don't know. This is where the old apostles and the prophets used to have visions of God. And this is a, this experience is for each and every believer. It's not for super Christians. It's not for those who are fasted. It's not for those who speak in tongues. No. According to the plan and the will of God, Jesus gave us the access. And that's why the veil was torn. So this is where we stand in, in the place of altars. Wow, powerful. Yeah, this is exactly what we want to grab a hold of here. This is, you have an open heaven if you approach God his way, and Jesus is the way. We don't want to be like Nadab and Abihu in, in, in the tabernacle times, approaching God with an unholy fire. So anything contrary to the word of God uh, that we decide to say, I'm going to approach God this way, is a violation of his holiness. Let me just say this. The earth is his footstool. Uh, when when Mary was at the feet of Jesus and Martha's like, wow, you know, I'm running around doing everything. And Jesus says, well, she's doing the one thing that's most important. We are constantly on God's footstool because we are on the earth. And so we should understand the reverence and the holiness of God and the gift and call that's on you to be the temple of God. We're coming up on the half hour here. It asks the Pastor International. We want you to join us at KATV 2023 on YouTube as well as 
CB Net Media on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, like, and share them. If you turn on the closed caption, it'll stream across the bottom of their screen in their own language. Visit our website. You'll see them on the screen. Uh, check us out on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media sites. We haven't even gotten to one of our questions initially for today, just in the discussion of trying to bring revelation and understanding about Altars here in America, altars there. But but as you mentioned, uh, Elijah, we have witchcraft. Obviously, there's covens here. Uh, you know, many of you will know about the Salem witch trials in the 1700s. It's still going on today. Uh, and 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 the the Native Americans are very spiritual people. And there are places here in Arizona and and elsewhere in in the Western Hemisphere where people go and there's what they call an open heaven or a portal. And yes, it's not always a Holy Spirit moment. It can be demonic. And so I'm going to pass it to Pastor Simon because we haven't heard from him yet, but you're welcome. If you're on any of our social media sites, you can make comments. You can ask questions. We will get to them. I always check after the program. But Pastor Simon, We've heard a lot already. As I said, we haven't even touched on one specific question. So, Pastor Simon, fill us in on what God's uh, brought you through over this past week as we even started this discussion. All right. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I would say, I'll say this has been a heavy, heavy thing for us. Uh, through Since we started, we have had to restructure a lot, ask questions, discuss with, within ourselves, with our friends, mm -hmm. see whether what we are carrying is what everyone has, is the same understanding. It's been, it's been a, a lot of work just to get this in the right way. And I, I, I think um, uh, uh, Wellington and, uh, and, and my brother uh, uh, Randu have, have almost touched on everything. Uh, because I would just repeat and say that Africa is deeply religious. I think the aspect of that uh, made the uh, entry of the gospel in our land easier. We were only now talking about who to worship. It, it wasn't a matter of whether worship is, is, is happening. They, they, it did not find an empty place. And I think God allowed these things to happen with this consciousness of, uh, of a being, of, 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 of a God somewhere who, who takes charge. Sometimes it's many, sometimes it's one, depending on where we come from. But our cultures are at this, every tribe at this one place that they knew if it is not raining, then we need to offer this God, we need to offer this ram, and uh, there will be rain. There were rainmakers, there were those things that have come in. Altars in our context are brought with a lot of understanding because of the background that we've had in our own um, African culture, uh, much as it wasn't as much as holy, but that platform is what God has used to, used to push to all this. When I'm listening to how many uh, rams and goats and, um, and, 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 and the bulls that to be offered for God to speak, and in our time, uh, looking at now, that being only the cross, I, I think I am proud to be in a, in a New Testament time. Uh -huh. That uh, th There's so much that has been paid by Christ, sometimes we do not see it, until we go back now to the number seven and look at how much all this was. And during the offering of Solomon, you see how many uh, 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 bulls had to be slaughtered and, and, and all that. And in our time, it gives us an opportunity to appreciate what Christ came to do for us. It gives us an opportunity to see God coming down. And all these things were people trying to, you know, appease God a little bit so that he would come and do this. In our African context, it was, we would have to appease the gods or by their names, whatever they were, every tribe had their own place. Um, you know, some would face Mount Kenya, others would be in shrines. You know, this place, we were trying to appease God so that he would be happy with us and grant us some good things. But now in our new, new Christian understanding, we already have Christ who has done all that. Now we are loved. Now we do not have to appease God. Now we have to just receive what God himself has given us. These altars, this is a principle that has been carried from far. From the Old Testament, we are seeing the patriarchal times when there was no law. And then it's a, during the, the times of Moses, and it is carried through. But uh, one thing that I noted uh, about altars, even as we begin, was how the pre, uh, the pre law, you know, the patriarchal times, how it used to be. Uh, some of these 
were, we, we would have sacrifices being done. Some of them were just a memory of an encounter with God. I, I think that is what Elijah has mentioned a lot. It was, we see Jacob journeying, and then he gets to Bethel, and he sleeps on a stone. Mm -hmm. And then he sees a ladder, angels coming up and down. And when he wakes up, there was no offer in that his record that, that he made, but he set up a structure. He set up the stones uh, to, as a memory for what God had done. So that, that is something that we can carry in our time for the purpose of the encounter, because the altar aspect has been carried from those times through the law and now into the New Testament. And because all these things was there was something that was being offered, whether by word or by a sacrifice, or whether it is an animal or some grain that was being burned on it, there was always something that is happening. And the, that, that, that aspect has been carried forward to our times because there is always something that we are carrying that is there to offer. Whether it is a praise, whether it is an offering, whether it is tithe, whether it's something. The, the principle underlying the altar has never died. We may not erect right now an, an altar physically as it were in the times, but at least we have, we still have churches, we still have gathering places, whether it is under a tree, whether there are two or three where they meet Jesus is in their midst, whether they are breaking bread like in the, in the, in the, in the, in the first church, there's always something that is being offered. So the aspect of the, of, of, of the altar is being carried through a lot of culture, it's been carried through a lot of law. It's been carried through a lot of practices. And now, unfortunately, we will understand it as we go forth in our African context that altars did not come to us in a very positive way, unfortunately. For us, we do not, when we hear altars, we are, our, 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 you know, our hair stands because we are about, <laughs> about, about some evil, some, something that, you know, is, is, is scratching way below where we want to, to, to hear. It's something, there's some, some, something dark coming out of it. And so as we start off, it, it's a big thing, and we pray God helps us through all this time, so that we may dissect it, and it may not be a day or two, but as we start, as we've said, we have not even started one question. We are just at the preliminaries, starting all this. But that is my opening way. I will, I will look at it as a, a practice and a principle that is come from before the law, in the law, in a culture where there was no law, we, there was, we were not... In Africa, we were not Jews, and, and all that has come. And now at, at the same time, we have one altar that is irrespective of the culture. It is irrespective of, of, of the color, you know, pigmentation and all that. And that is the cross of Christ. Thank you so much, Mark. Amen, brother. And that brings us right up to where I wanted to go before we even started the questions, because we wanted to clarify this on both sides. Look. We don't have all the answers. We have the Bible. That's what God's given us. And that's what we're going to give you. But we also want to talk about culture and the history and so that we do understand uh, the things that we're up against and the good things that we have to offer. Let me let me just say this, because uh, what, what Simon just talked about were all the types and shadows leading up to Christ. That's what the whole scripture is, right? The law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. And so the idea of, of Noah's altar and the tabernacle and, and, the, and the, uh, the, the temple itself, uh, I will tell you this, the last year of uh, President Trump being in office here in America, in Jerusalem, they offered up the altar that is going to be built for the third temple. And they used a lamb's leg in representation rather than sacrificing a lamb because they weren't allowed. But, but these things are coming. These things are prophesied in scripture. And I did want to read this. This is, this is known as the last altar in the scriptures. We heard a lot out of Hebrews already, but Hebrews chapter 13, it's, it says in verse 10, and I'm going to read this, and then maybe we'll get into our first question, or we can just go around the room with comments. We have an altar from which those who serve and worship in the tabernacle have no right to eat. That This is us. This is because of what Jesus did. These are all those who are in Christ and the Messiah and the anointed one for when the blood of animals is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin the victims bodies are burned outside the limits of the camp therefore Jesus also suffered and died outside the city's gate in order that he might purify 
and consecrate the people through the shedding of his own blood and set them apart as holy for God. So what this is saying is that the cross is the final altar. That's why we kind of hear the phrase, come to the cross, come to Jesus. But the blood, his life that was shed is what the biblical word is propitiation. What it means is he paid the price for your sin, for my sin, for all the sin from Adam up to today and beyond until he returns. And we need to understand the price that was paid. The one and only beloved son of God gave his life, became sin for us on the cross so that you and I, being born again of his spirit, can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so I'm, I'm going to, uh, we're, we're looking at the time here. We probably got about 19 minutes left. But be, before I go for the first question, in light of all these scriptures, uh, let, let's go to where we began with Grover. Uh, everything we've discussed so far, everything we've heard, and I see some questions popping up online here. That's good. Keep coming. We will get to you. I did want to say this. Our Native American brothers and sisters here in America and elsewhere will we'll offer up, uh, for instance, here we have the corn goddess. And so as, as Simon was saying, you know, you'd offer up something to appease the gods or the goddesses. We don't have to do that. Jesus is offered up. And today, as we lift him up, he draws all men unto him. We become the temple of the living God. We are the living altar. We are the living sacrifice. We live at the feet of Jesus because the earth is his footstool. So Grover, in light of everything we've discussed, and as I said, we haven't even touched on the first question of the day. Uh, what are your insights so far today? Okay, let me let me unmute here. Um, the, a couple of things. I'm just seeing some things here as we're as we're relating to these things. We see God godly altars. We see mostly in the Old Testament, and we're seeing satanic altars. I mean, pe things that are way off the other direction. But the thing that, that and these are of concern. But the other thing that God seems to really be uh, aware of and and against is the mixture of when we mix these two together. And, and I don't know how far we, we take that in this discussion, but oftentimes what we, what we see is, and what we see scripturally is, uh, even with Israel, they, were, they had the altars to God, but then they were sacrificing false, false things on that. They were, they were not doing it in the integrity of the faith. They were doing it in a different place. And I think that might be something that we're, we're talking about here. Uh, and I, I suspect, like in America, uh, what you're talking about, Mark, with our Native American brothers and friends uh, and other people, oftentimes they're, they're doing it in the name of God. They're doing it because this is they, their, their perception of God, but it's, it's evil. It's, it's not God, and it actually is a divisive thing that prevents them from walking in the fullness of God. The, the enemy, Satan, has, has uh, taken over some of these things. So I think that's something to, to be of, of concern. Uh, we see that in that scripture in, in uh, Revelation, the first part of Revelation, where he talks, uh, because you're neither hot nor cold, because, but you're lukewarm, I've cast you out. You know, this is Jesus speaking. And, and so, and I think he's talking about that mixture when we're, oh, here's a little bit of God and here's a little bit of something else. This is a place that that I is is critical to in God's eyes and it, and he's trying to make it critical in our eyes that we're following after the true God living in his life in his anointing in the in the holy spirit and we can't be walking in both these places at the same time so I, just a just a overview I'm looking at there Thank Yeah you, I hear you and and actually I think it was Simon who talked about uplifting certain things you know venerating yeah. certain things yeah. we see this whether it's uh even at the San Gennaro feast in New York, you know, it's a lot of food. It's a lot of worship. It's a lot of uh, conversation, but they're marching these statues around and they're venerating They're They're honoring these, uh, uh, you know, different saints and stuff like that. And as you said, we see it a lot here in New Mexico with the Spanish culture and the uh, Catholicism that came in and kind of blended some of the native traditions with biblical principles but as you said, and, and I mentioned it earlier, we do not want to be 
like Nadab and Abihu, mm, yep. who offered up unholy fire before God. Uh, Jim, comments so far on today? Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, this this mixture, I think, is really, really significant. And I thank you for bringing up this, this mixture. We cannot operate with mixture. However, I opened up with fear. Are we truly born again, or are we trying to appease God? Maybe because of past tradition, we want to cover all the bases. And that's the one of works. Going out there of double-minded, worshiping God as the as Jews did themselves out in the wilderness, offering to God, but then they under under every bush, every place they were offering sacrifices to Baal. This is something that we're doing here as well. I think it's more sophisticated. Well, we're Christians, but we still do all these things, all these practices. You already mentioned uh, Dia de los Muertos, which is the the, the, you know, the altars of the dead, and that continues. It's a mixture. We keep mixing it up. It is something we'll, no people will listen to you. You talk to them about it, but they they really do not hear. And the question is, are they truly born again? And I think that's one examination to ourselves. Are we truly born again, or we're still following traditions out of fear, uh, out of our culture, uh, just to make sure to have fire insurance? And we're going to cover all bases, worshiping all the gods, and continuing with Jesus, with the Lord Jesus. And that's we got to stop that. Yeah, you know, James, the half-brother of Jesus, was very clear talking about the doctrines of men and the doctrines of demons. Now, there are biblical doctrines. This is what we're trying to get across here on this program, talking about altars and every topic we're going to cover. We're going to try to lay it out biblically for you, but we want to rightfully divide the word of truth from both the Eastern and the Western Hemisphere because there are cultural differences and understanding. I'm going to go to, uh, we, we did get a comment here. Uh, it says, if we dismiss the practice and belief of altars by our former fathers, how then do we justify and claim the blessing of Abraham that were sacrificed on the altar as, as our former father? Keep in mind, he's referenced as our father of faith what makes the difference i'm going to throw this to pastor wellington if you want to pick up that topic there uh thank you uh i i think one of the things that uh we may or i may bring across to us for consideration is uh i think in the church we have altars legally and rightly but uh, sometimes they exist without necessarily coming into our minds. And I believe that uh, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross did not remove uh, the responsibility from us to offer sacrifices and worship in the New Testament. Uh, the Bible says that in the book of Ephesians, uh, Ephesians, Ephesians says, Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and to good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So there, when, when, when we get born again, we don't offer sacrifices to appease God for our salvation, but there are ways that, there are things that we do that, that are sacrificial, that are allowed by God. For instance, the Bible says that we should offer our bodies as living sacrifices. So, the place of sacrifices and offerings did not end after, uh, uh, after the cross, but it was redefined. I believe that in the Bible, there are things in the Bible that the cross did away with. And then there are things in the, in, in the Bible that the cross changed how we do them. Some were completely removed away, but some were redefined how we operate them. So how we offer sacrifices today, on the altars that we have are not necessarily how they did it before because we're, we already have a loving father who loves us and we're not trying to appease him. We, 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 he, he's in love with us, we're in love with him, but it, does, it still doesn't stop us like offering sacrifices of praise. So I believe that we have altars um, in the church, but they are not like the altars of the, the Old Testament. Humans were generally created by God to be altars, like I said from the beginning, to be channels of, 
of, of, of the divine coming into the world. So uh, we were given dominion. So uh, Paul says we are temples of the Holy Spirit. And where there is a temple, there is an altar. So God uses us to come and touch humanity. We, 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 uh, we, we do those on the altar, but it is, it is New Testament altars. So humans are altars. Ordinances that God has given us through the scriptures are altars. Uh, for instance, the Holy Communion, it has a specific thing that it does to, the, to, to us when we, we do it. Prayer is a place of, 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 of altar. When, when we set a, a time apart to go and pray, it becomes a point of contact for God to answer our prayers and to have a relationship with us. Dedicated places of worship where we dedicate a place and we call it a place of worship where Jesus said, when two or three are gathered there, I'm going to be there. So it's, it's like an altar that attracts the presence of God when two or three are gathered. So we are not, we, we are not tied to the Old Testament and what Abraham did, although he was our father, in the faith, we don't go about uh, trying to slaughter our, our children so that uh, God will come and, and give us a ram. So th there are things that they, uh, Abraham did, but uh, he's our father in the faith, but there are things that in the New Testament, God still will not allow us to do those things. So in the New Testament, uh, the altars are redefined, and most of the time they work without necessarily us thinking about them, it's, it becomes almost like a natural cause of life for a born-again Christian. Thank you. Thank you so much. You really clarified a lot of things. The one thing I think about with Abraham is he was going to offer up his son Isaac. Remember, God called him to this, so he built this altar, right? Uh, Isaac's carrying the wood. He says, well, where's the sacrifice? And what Abraham says, God will provide himself a lamb. What we see is a ram caught in the bushes, caught in the thickets, as it says, and that is what was sacrificed. And so, again, that was to really bring Isaac back from death to life, almost like a resurrection. Again, these are all types and shadows, but I totally agree with you. Our worship is an offering. Our giving is an offering. Our prayers are offerings, and we become the altar of the living God because we are the temple. Elijah, uh, closing comments on this. Thank you, thank you. I see time really flies. And also thank you, Destiny, for being a consistent follower. May God bless you. When you look in the book of Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, allow me to read that. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. The Bible says, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Yeah, one of the duties that we shall be given even after we have received the glorious body, after this old world is passed, we become priests. And uh, as I said earlier, that every altar has a priest. And a priest is a person who stands to service an altar. That means that an altar will continue to play a very significant role to us believers, even after we have gotten into the new Jerusalem. So it is very paramount for us to really understand the functions and the roles of altars. And many of us only have it one way about the sacrifices that were made. I want you to know one thing, even in the Old Testament, when people came before God, offering of sacrifices, the sin offerings, it was only part of the bargain. But they were coming to worship God. That's why they were told to build a temple in a place where all Israel will gather and worship God. And one of the reasons as to why we began having false altars when we come to Jeroboam it was one thing. He wanted to prevent the children of Israel from following the true God. Because they knew if they followed the true God, they will give in to the will of the true God. And they will come under the reigning king, the true king of David, who is Jesus Christ. So one of the reasons why we have many, many fake altars is to prevent us from coming to the knowledge of Jesus and to the supremacy and the lordship of Jesus Christ. So once we become priests, we 
are responsible to service our altars. We are responsible in offering living sacrifices to God. We are responsible in worshiping God. Remember one of the reasons why the Bible says in the book of Revelation, now the dwelling of God is with man, is because he inhabits the new Jerusalem and he becomes a temple. Because the Bible says in there is no temple there. There is no physical altar there. Why? Because the lamp and God himself, they are the temple. One of the main reasons why God created us is to worship him as a priest. How are you servicing your altar? Have you forsaken your altar? Have you forsaken your service to God and you are consumed with the mundane things of this world? At times we come to church because we want to get things from God. We go to altars because we want God to bless us. We want God to protect us. We want God to fight for us. Yes, that is part of the things. Altars are meant to protect. They are meant to fight our battles. They are meant to enforce the will of God here on earth. They are meant to enforce the kingdom of God because you are a king, you are a priest. But above all, God is interested in your worship. I think I'd just like to leave it at that. Amen. Listen, uh, I'm going to read a question, but I'm going to pass it on for closing comments to Pastor Simon. Destiny again, she says, next time address the issue of African pastors using the issue of altars to solicitize money from ignorant believers. That, that, <laughs> this, is, this is the bottom line, right? Talk about uh, uh, what we're talking about here. But again, we want to get you away from the worldly things and the demonic things and into the truth of God because the truth will set you free. And he who the sun sets free is free indeed. So Pastor Simon, we only have two minutes left. If you can give us some closing comments. Thank you so much. I, I think we've just scratched the, uh, the the surface of this. And and yes, we'll be talking about that. And I'm laughing because I know that is a big problem here in our in our in our in our sphere. And uh, we have a problem with uh, people making money out of uh, this issue of altars. I think we will take time and address that. Thank you for bringing up. I'll I'll close with this. All these issues, all these altars. All these things that were being done, how many rams, how many courts, how many, what we needed to get from God. The time, the difference between our time and the time before, the, the, the what the Bible calls when we were still ignorant. The, the difference between that time with and now is that all those altars were picked from their different cultural areas, were picked from uh, different continents, were picked from different practices, from different colors and people, from different languages, and brought to one colorless, you know, one that cannot be defined by a color, that cannot be defined by a region called the cross. It was, it was a practice of the Jews, but then now it has become the significant altar in our time. But do not forget that we have we still have things to offer. As uh, Wellington says, it is our, how we do it in our time that is different from how our fathers used to do it because of ignorance. I will say this as a finish. It is ignorance that has kept the war about altars still in the picture today. Because even after Christ has done everything, we are not yet sure that it is all done. We are even our pastors and problems, as our brother is saying, that we need to bring up this. Is we still think that there is something remaining to be done. Well, even when the perfect, uh, perfect uh, sacrifice has been given, we are still looking for some more ways. Why? We are not, we are not, we have not understood yet where we come from. And I pray that God enables every one of us to be free from all these troubles and come to the one cross which answers all the problems of all the altars and remain there and deal with that alone. And with that, we will be able now to progress forward to see how to offer what we have against what we have been offering or what we have had from different charlatans and other people that do not understand the word of God. So may God help us even as we go to the next level that we will understand that the work is finished by Jesus on the cross and it is his own word. He did not send an angel to say those words. Neither us. He said it himself that it is finished. Thank you so much.
Amen. And so we'll just close with this. Come to the altar who happens to be Jesus. Come to the cross. Come to the communion table to have communion and fellowship with your heavenly father who loves you and sent his son to die for you. We'll continue this conversation for sure next week on Ask the Pastor International. Thank you for joining us this week. Look for us online. Be sure to like and share these videos. And thank you so much. We'll talk to you again next week. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.